Hello and namaste. A very warm welcome to our first webinar uh, in 2022 on uh, mobilizing community, uh, community mobilization in promoting mental health literacy. We have uh, two distinguished panelists uh, with us this afternoon um, to discuss how um, the SCARF India Foundation um, have developed that uh, community mobilization program. So welcome um, Dr. Padmavati um, and Dr. Mangala um, from Schizophrenia Research Foundation uh, in Chennai in India. I will introduce you both uh, in a minute uh, in, in detail. But let me just introduce uh, the topic itself. Really. And mental health literacy uh, is something that we have actually worked on as part of the mental health literacy project um, in India uh, over the last three years. That project is come to an end uh, at the 31st of December last year, and that's been resurrected in a different format um, called the Me Help India Foundation called Mental Health Literacy Foundation, purely with the aim to actually promote uh, mental health literacy um, as, as an aspect that uh, uh, both within India and also across the world, and also to conduct um, awareness uh, research, um, and also to promote uh, that within our relations with young people, um, schools, universities, employers, um, and the like. So there's a big agenda in, in front of that, in front of us in relation to how we promote it. I am Regu Raghavan, I'm a professor of mental health uh, at Dunford University in Leicester in the UK. People often talk about uh, mental health literacy in the loosest um, term, uh, and we think that mental health literacy is more than uh, mental health awareness. Mental health literacy uh, normally consists of our awareness uh, of the conditions that people might actually experience in terms of what we call mental health or mental ill health, mental uh, distress uh, or mental illness. Um, and, and one of the kind of, uh, secondly, it consists of the kind of causative factors that what are trigger factors that might actually uh, cause um, mental distress or mental illness. And thirdly, in relation to what are the kind of things that we can actually do to prevent it? What are the kind of things that we can actually do to, um, you know, self-help um, uh, approaches, uh, which might include a range of um, factors, range of, range of activities such as yoga, meditation, uh, hobbies, and many other things that can be um, that dealt with in relation to addressing and understanding our own um, thoughts and feelings and emotions. And fourthly, the kind of, you know, what kind of help um, is actually available for that in terms of um, a professional help, such as such as psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and nursing, or any other kind of uh, professional help that might be available um, for those um, uh, with, for with people uh, with those conditions. And and fifthly, in relation to um, how do we eradicate the stigma um, around mental illness, because that is the main. Um, reason um, that people may not be HD accessing services and not be having much of an awareness about it. That's the reason why people uh, are discriminated, people are actually segregated, uh, and, and a lot of things actually happen, not just in India, but around the world as well in relation to the stigma being a major uh, block, a major barrier in terms of understanding the reality of mental health and well-being and also about mental stress. And also, the, you know, sixthly, in relation to what kind of information and what are the right kind of information that can be taken? Because a lot of information around in the current social media context, everybody else, um, everywhere else. But what is the right information that you can actually um, uh, act upon? How can we channel the right kind of information um, about it? So that is mental health literacy. Our own work in India over the last three years have actually added another dimension to that, um, the sixth format of dimension uh, of mental health literacy proposed by John and others in Australia. We think uh, our own addition to that is that it is not just, it is not a mental health literacy is not a unified concept. And it is, we call it mental health literacies. There are a number of things that actually happens to and our own culture and cultural heritage, cultural values, norms, and all those things plays a major role um, in relation to what is mental health literacy. So uh, mental health literacy could be seeing a psychiatrist, seeing, a, seeing an astrologer, um, going to a temple, church, or a mosque. Um, it could be a number of other things. All these things consider as a mental health literacy. It's not just a unified concept of it. So, so that's what we mean by uh, mental health literacy. And from 
mental from me help india foundation what we aim to promote um, is mental health literacy in urban rural and tribal contexts in india and we wish to do that through engagement with uh, uh, esteemed people like uh, today's panelists um, and also in connection with many of the higher education institutions and uh, governmental organizations in india and abroad and also through um, applied research in, in promoting uh, mental health literacy its impact um, and its awareness for the wider public and how it might actually help in terms of prevention and also what we call public mental health programs so that is what our aim is and this is our first webinar as i said at the very beginning uh, and, and in 2022 um, so we have two um, esteemed um, guest panelists um, for our program today um, Dr. Padmavati um, and, and Dr. Mangala from Schizophrenia Research Foundation. Welcome, uh, Dr. Padma and Dr. Mangala, to our program. Um, it's great to have you with us um, to discuss this important topic of, of which SCARF has actually worked on for the last 25 to 30 years. So it's great to, uh, to have you, your presence here and for our, our, our opportunity to actually discuss and digest and actually also maybe develop, develop some action plans as how we might move forward in the future as well. So let me introduce um, our, our panelists first. Uh, I'll come to Dr. Padmavati. Um, Dr. Padmavati is a postgraduate um, psychiatry, um, completed a postgraduate psychiatry degree in University of Bombay um, and India, um, and, and, and um, since then has been with Schizophrenia Research Foundation, SCARF Chennai, over the last 30 years. She has been involved in several research areas like epidemiological studies, drug trials, untreated schizophrenia, culture, psychosis, metabolic disorders in mental illness. She's the co-investigator of the Intrepid 2 study. She has been closely involved in SCARF's community mental health programs in the tele and the telepsychiatry project. Her key interests have been in sociocultural aspects of mental illness, uh, and she has conducted research in the area of stigma in mental, uh, in mental health rehabilitation. And she's been responsible for establishing the Department of Psychosocial Rehabilitation at SCARF, which provides a needs-based psychosocial intervention program for persons accessing SCARF clinical services for treatment and rehabilitation. She's a reviewer of many national and international psychiatric journals and is associate editor of the International Journal of Mental Health Systems. She serves on institutional uh, review boards. She teaches postgraduate students in psychiatry and is a guide for postgraduate um, research dissertations. Very warm welcome to you, Dr. Patnavati. Great to be, uh, have you with us. Our next panelist is also from SCARF, uh, Dr. Mangala. Um, Dr. Mangala has 25 years of experience in the field of um, psychiatry. After completing her uh, medical degree uh, from Tanjavu Medical College, she completed her postgraduate training in psychiatry in the Institute of Mental Health, Chennai, attached to the Madras Medical College to receive her diploma in psychological medicine. She's at present the assistant director of the media and communication at SCARF, uh, where she has been a consultant psychiatrist for 18 years and is actively involved in the clinical services, including residential facilities, research and community-based activities. She's a consultant in charge of um, Bavish Shabavan, a resident, uh, residential unit at SCARF, a 70 bedded facility for women uh, and elderly men. She has developed a digital online course for sensitive um, reporting on mental health issues for journalists as part of the Essence Project, a partner in Sangat, Wabhal, um, and funded by NIH, so, and um, serves as a mentor for fellows, fellows um, that are part of the project. As director in charge of awareness and communication, she's involved in organizing events to promote education and awareness of mental health related issues in the public. She conducts seminars and workshops to train people from varied backgrounds to sensitize them to mental health related issues and includes students of schools and colleges and general medical practitioners, para medical professionals and self help groups and lay public. She also regularly participates in television and radio talk shows focusing on mental health issues. She has been uh, one of the key organizers of Frame Mind, a film festival on mental health, first of its kind in India, which has had nine successful 
editions so far. She has participated in several conferences at national and international and Pacific levels. She has also published papers in peer reviewed journals and indexed journals. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Mangala, uh, to the program. So great to have um, both uh, two distinguished guests with us. So what I'm going to ask, this is going to be very much of an interactive um, discussion webinar. So uh, participants, uh, please feel free to actually put your questions um, in the chat box. We will actually come back to them in about 30 minutes, 30 minutes or so, once we have uh, uh, had a bit of a breath, uh, depth discussion um, on community mobilization uh, by SCARP for mental health literacy. So Dr. Padma is actually going to actually talk about the work of SCARF for about five minutes. And then Dr. Mangala is actually going to talk about the kind of community mobilization activities that they have actually conducted over the years. And then we will actually enter a mode of discussion um, amongst ourselves and also with the participants of the webinar. So enjoy, sit back and enjoy, um, and uh, we, will, we will have an active interactive session. So over to you, uh, Dr. Padma. So, yeah, thank you, Dr. Raghu. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening, where we uh, are going to be uh, hope, are going to be really coming up with a lot of discussion on our mental health literacy, as you said. But before that, let me just tell you a little story about SCARF. The Schizophrenia Research Foundation is about thirty-seven years old now, and it came into existence. Uh, for, uh, simply because of a felt need for rehabilitation in the community. At that time, there were only two kinds of services, one delivered by the um, government sector, which was very overcrowded and no focus, not much focus on rehabilitation. And the other one was a private um, psychiatric setup, which was expensive and not really, uh, you know, affordable by a large mass of the population. So the late, late Dr. Sharada Menon and a group of other people actually got together to dis and decided that, you know, you need to offer services to the people, especially with serious mental illnesses in terms of uh, rehabilitation. But clearly you can't do uh, that as a standalone kind of entity. So they, they all, uh, the, the group that time also wanted to deliver clinical services and rehabilitation. I mean, rehab will not come if you do not do clinical services. Alongside that came in the public awareness um, uh, programs. And of course, we have grown since then. We now do a lot of training. We do community outreach and so many other uh, programs that we have. So the journey over the last three and a half plus um, uh, you know, years has really been um, spotted with a lot of uh, interesting developments. Our SCARF's contribution to research is globally acclaimed. We are a WHO collaborating center for mental health research and training. Which is, and possibly the only NGO who has got, which has got the status in mental health, right? And that this is really of, uh, I mean, has really sustained uh, a lot of our activities because much of the research findings have been poured back into clinical services. And, you know, are the numbers of people seeking help at SCARF has grown remarkably over uh, the last three and a half decades. So today in the OPD, we have about close to 150 patients a day for five days a week. And so it's like, you know, and our staff numbers have also naturally grown uh, with that. Our, um, much of our research activities, I'm not really going into it because that's not the substance of today's uh, talk, but has really tried to understand what serious mental disorders, particularly schizophrenia is all about. What is the social impact? We don't really have fancy labs and so on. Although we have been doing some kind of genetic work, but we don't really do much of biological research. And so most of our uh, work is on social uh, aspects of schizophrenia. And so that again has fed into many of our awareness programs that we have done over the over a period of time. It is our, you know, uh, it's our, uh, what to say, endeavor uh, throughout to sustain public interest in mental health problems. And I'm sure over a period, I mean, you, when you listen to Dr. Mangala uh, next, you will realize all the creative efforts that we have to take to be able to keep the public engaged, in, keep the community really, uh, you know, interested in listening to uh, mental health uh, news. And I must very proudly say that we're not only reaching people who have a problem, we are also reaching the masses because 
you know, most of the time, people who have a problem, people whose family members have a problem, listen to all that you have to say. But reaching out to the common man is something of a real challenge. And I must I must say here, thanks to uh, um, spearheaded by Dr. Mangla, we have really been able to reach a number of community people. Examples of such would be schools and colleges, uh, the mental health um, the literacy programs that uh, Mangla actually runs, um, the journalists, filmmakers, you name it, and we have done it, right? And so it's our sustained effort to actually, you know, um, keep this going because no, I, I, I believe sincerely that there is no not enough, there is never a dearth of information that we can give to the uh, public. And every challenge, every, uh, you know, situation is a kind of a challenge and we have to creatively address it. So the kind of uh, information messaging that we do, which of course, uh, will, Mangala will detail, but has been a rather social model of, uh, um, you know, literacy. And I think that's important because that's where stigma and discrimination uh, happens, and that's what we need to uh, uh, really tap into. So it's it's um, so scarf is really you know uh, 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 to say we have put, been putting our sustained efforts into all this. So um, trying to balance clinical work as well as uh, research as well as uh, public awareness um, has been a wonderful journey. Thank you, Dr. Raghu, for initiating this whole webinar, and I'm sure we will have an exciting time uh, through the rest of the day. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Padmavati, for that uh, brilliant introduction in relation to the work of SCARF and the kind of programs that actually goes on. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I think it is, it is indeed a pleasure to actually hear from you in relation to the kind of kind of work that is actually engaged, the kind of sort of pioneering work in the mental health in India, and also not just in India, from, from worldwide perspective as well. So I think it's, it's great to hear, to hear that. Okay, thank you. I'll come back to you. Um, we'll uh, go into some kind of discussion mode uh, in a minute. Um, but now, can I ask Dr. Mangala um, to uh, outline uh, or pitch uh, in relation to the community mobilization um, activities that SCARF is actually undertaking? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Raghu, and I think we are looking forward to a really interesting discussion on this very important uh, topic, which is very close to our hearts as well. Uh, so uh, where do I start? I think, as Dr. Padma mentioned, SCARF, when it, when it was envisioned as a first of its kind non-governmental organization in the field of mental health, one of the three major agenda uh, points in the agenda was uh, raising awareness. That was the third uh, point which was included in the constitution of SCARF when it was first framed. And uh, I think from um, the beginning, in the beginning, you know, uh, people were complaining about the word schizophrenia because it was difficult for them to pronounce that word. And I think Dr. Sharda Menon was very firm that that word will remain. And from explaining what schizophrenia means in 1984, I think we have come a long way when people understand what schizophrenia is, even without us explaining some of those uh, details, nuances of how to pronounce it. And if we look at the community engagement of SCARF, in the initial years, I think the community engagement was primarily associated with fundraising. Uh, fundraising was a major activity because I think they started with probably a few hundreds of rupees that was put together by just those four souls who wanted to start this institution. So from there, I think fundraising became, uh, it went hand in hand with awareness. I think unwittingly or unknowingly, it also became an, an awareness initiative. So, you know, when uh, Dr. Sharda Minan never shied from traveling all over the country, meeting people. Uh, I think over the period of uh, the first few years, she met Ambani, she met uh, a lot of big people and uh, people from the film world. And well, then the focus was only uh, fundraising, but it definitely had an impact because even now when people come back and say, they associate SCARF with, oh, you had a film screening of Passage to India some time back, no? 
because um, what happened was every small event which had a celebrity associated with scarf's function definitely got covered by the press. And I think um, uh, Victor Banerjee, the hero of Passage to India, uh, created definitely a lot of ripples when he refused to change his dress uh, to follow the dress code of the Madras uh, uh, club. And so it had to be, uh, the, the club had to accommodate him in his routine kurta and pajama. So uh, that made news. And any news became very, very useful for spreading the word about this organization because many people were not aware of such a facility being available for, the, for providing services for persons with serious mental health issues. So that way, the print media, which covered every little thing that we did, played a huge role. But from there, now we have come a long way. Now we have uh, in events where people with lived experiences are able to come forward and talk about their experiences, share their, their, their diagnosis, and how they have overcome their problem. So I think that's a very long journey, but still, there is still a lot that needs to be done. Some of the key things that I think we have to uh, mention here will be, you know, uh, the uh, WPA chose SCARF to be its partner in the anti-stigma campaign way back in 2003, uh, 2004. So uh, we thought we should do something different. And then uh, the schizophrenia day was not being observed in India till then. And I think I can confidently say that SCARF was uh, probably one of the first few NGOs which decided we will recognize that date and make it a, a, a time for raising awareness about schizophrenia. And the first schizophrenia day was a very, it was a big uh, tamasha that we, we had organized. Uh, we thought of all kinds of things. We had messages on the milk packets that were circulated in the city. You know? uh, uh, again, very it was it was an expensive affair to print on the milk packets. So we decided to go for a uh, just a, a seal, you know, like that. Uh, I don't know what you call it, you know, in violet ink. It is just a stamp that is made on the milk packets. And uh, I was so happy when I got my milk packet in the morning and I found this message from Scarf with the phone numbers and all that. It was very thrilled. But then I I must say that we had one patient who came after that uh, initiative. I mean, I, when I'm saying one patient who came and mentioned that they saw the message on the milk packet and so they came. Uh, but then there were a lot of calls, uh, which were, there were complaints about the milk, you know, that the milk was getting spoiled soon. We had to handle those kind of calls yeah. as well when, for the next couple of days. And then we thought we should have uh, hoardings behind the bus. The bus back is a uh, it's a place for advertisements in the in the uh, city buses. So we tried that, you know, we designed beautiful uh, posters and we put, put it up. And again, uh, it, it was not just organizing these events, you know, getting people to do it for us at a reduced rate or, at, or free of cost as a corporate social responsibility. That was the bigger task. And we had to spend a lot of time and energy in doing that so uh, and we also the local uh, telephone uh, company the bsnl they obliged us with a message uh, about the uh, world schizophrenia day you know just saying that schizophrenia is a treatable illness so seek help early you know that was the only message so there were queries about what this was uh, when they contacted us and you know, that was one way we could reach out to a large number but then we found that these are all very time consuming and actually not really uh, going to serve the purpose very much. And so we started focusing on much smaller uh, groups, you know, whether they were the uh, local women's self-help groups or schools and colleges. We had regular sessions in multiple places. Uh, it was like almost we were, any one of us at staff will be doing at least one session with one group of people somewhere in the city. And uh, later we introduced, you know, the street theater group, you know, with our patients and staff who are working together. 
and they used to perform in public uh, uh, places where we chose to have an awareness program. It could be parks, it could be, we have even done it in the middle of the road, as the name suggests, a proper street theater. And uh, the what was more impactful was uh, the fact that these people who were uh, playing the roles in the theater, in the group, when they come forward to reveal that they are all people with schizophrenia who have been on treatment, that had a greater impact with the audience than all that content and the message that they were carrying. Because in every other scenario, it will be uh, us who will be talking for persons with mental health issues, uh, especially when we had to negotiate, I mean, we had to collaborate with people with other disabilities when we organized staff decided to have a disability mela where we had uh, all disabilities coming together and having a, a exhibition uh, for about three, four days where all of us come and display all information and things like that. And uh, it, was, it was very obvious that we felt we were the outsiders because all other people were all uh, people with lived experiences and they were service users and we were just representing somebody else. So involving the patients in the uh, events became more important than ever before. So I think I will stop here. We have, and then the film festivals about which uh, it, we have already spoken a lot. You know, we had the uh, we had about we have had nine editions so far, and each edition had both feature films and short films contests. Um, more than the film festival itself, I think the coverage that the print media gave us for the film festival, covering each film, which mental health aspect that it uh, it is discussing, all those kind of uh, things, you know, it helped in spreading more awareness because the film was actually viewed only by about a maximum of 200 people in the auditorium for any given film. So. The, and the short film contests were another uh, interesting and very important thing because uh, it made people, young people, to think about how mental health can be displayed. It, it made them understand that what was not right about the way they have been perceiving mental health or conceiving plots in their mind. And as part of this uh, event, we started having regular training on the theme of the contest. And primarily to tell the uh, people, uh, potential participants what not to submit as entries, you know, what we wanted them to avoid in their uh, films. So we were running regular workshops for uh, the city colleges, the students of the visual and the media sciences. And in fact, uh, I must say uh, some of us at staff, we have traveled to almost all the major uh, cities in Tamil Nadu just to meet all the students in the various colleges, talk to them about the festival and encourage them to send in entries. That we were able to uh, do more awareness that way than the actual festival. So, and uh, I think after the film festivals, I at least get to see a, one or two filmmakers, you know, young filmmakers who, are, who wish to come and discuss with us their plots and how the, uh, whether the mental health component is right and not just with us i know from other friends who are in private uh, practice in chennai a lot of them are now being approached by filmmakers for uh, consultation about how the plot is uh, whether it is acceptable or not to depict mental health in a certain way so i think i'll stop here it has been too long no, thank you very much. I think that's very interesting. I like the idea of, um, you know, the mental health uh, sort of tapped onto milk bottles and milk packages um, and, and the kind of back of the bus and all those. They are all kind of innovative ideas. People look at these things and everybody, you know, uh, everybody uh, in our society, in our community uses all, all these things. So I think it's how we actually reach out to those people. Um, so I think that's sort of very much an important uh, way and, and, and how we believe in that there is no health without mental health. Um, and I think we need to try and, and pitch at that level. So very, thank you very much for that uh, uh, outlining all the kind of, I know, I know there are many, many activities that you have actually done at staff, but I think just let's, let's, let's dive into some, some um, in-depth discussions. So 
I would like to ask um, Dr. Padma um, this um, question in relation to you know, social um, and cultural issues around schizophrenia and also broadly in relation to mental illness. Um, obviously, um, you know, I, knew, I know you were deeply interested in it, and I think the, the, some of the principles and norms of SCARF is actually based on that particular uh, area. And obviously, the Western psychiatry doesn't believe in culture. Western psychiatry doesn't actually believe in any of these things at all in terms of social stuff. So yeah. can you sort of outline how this might actually help us to have better information um, about mental illness in general um, and also maybe specific things about schizophrenia? Uh, thank you, Dr. Raghu. It's a really interesting area, and I hope I don't keep uh, rambling because this is something that's, uh, you know, uh, there's so much to talk about it, right? Now, uh, let me start with a small narrative. Yes, sir, as a consultant, I'm sitting in the OPD, and I in walks, uh, you know, two young people who are clad in a burqa, right? And... Um, they come and they start the conversation about, um, you know, uh, having some kind of um, problems. And I noticed that one of them is repeatedly using the word skiz, just the word skiz. So I have to understand that they are referring to a mental health problem, which I can at that first meeting assume they're talking about schizophrenia, but they'll say skiz. And then, so, I mean, based on interest and of course, uh, training in uh, history taking, you ask them about their family. And I get to know that they're actually coming from very orthodox Tamil Brahmin families, right? So then my next question is, why is a burqa, right? Why are you wearing a burqa? And she said, no, we don't want others to know that we are, uh, you know, they're, they're, it is likely that somebody from my family would have also come here so I don't want them to know, and that's why the burqa. And you know, you the impact of all our uh, psycho education, the content. I've been seeing them for now three decades, and for three decades they have been walking in with the burqa, right? So what does this mean? Does this mean that I've not been able to make any impact on them for uh, their uh, acknowledging their mental illness? No. Today they will tell me a lot. I mean. The Google really educates people a lot. So they will tell me a whole lot of information about uh, treatment resistant molecules, like uh, your molecules used for treatment resistant schizophrenia, like clozapine. I mean, all kinds of rare side effects will actually come up. And um, every time they walk in, I feel I'm taking my MD exams all over again, right? But the point I'm trying to make here is that this is the impact of social um, viewpoints on the individual. This is not an isolated case. There are a number of people like this. Not everybody walks in and the burqa, but they have their own reasons for how, uh, you know, uh, discriminated they feel or they fear discrimination and therefore come. Now you walk into a rural area. I mean, I've done a lot of uh, rural outreach. In fact, I even did a study. I wanted to understand why people were going to temples, dargahs, churches for mental health reasons. And um, it was a, a very enlightening, uh, I did some in-depth interviews for over 32 people at that time, but this was about 20 years ago. And I don't think the situation has really changed too much over the last uh, few decades. And the interesting thing was that they knew that there was an abnormal behavior, but would not really be willing to accept a medical model of the illness. Here I was going in and telling them, take tablets. I said, no, no, we don't want the pujari there would, uh, you know, but had, uh, help us to get over this medical model. And I was always very curious to know why is it. I remember walking into, there's a there's a famous temple near in, uh, you know, in Tamil Nadu, which is called Sholingur and uh, it's on a hilltop. And um, I walked in and I said, I must talk to the pujari because he's the one who's been saying, uh, uh, all saying things like, you know, this prayer and that prayer. And so I wanted to, maybe I went there with all enthusiasm to look, deliver a medical model of the illness, right? But then came away with so many interesting theories that he had about mental illness. One of them primarily being that, in fact, he did not really uh, advocate the evil spirits model. All that he wanted to do was to tell the people that, you know, you should have faith uh, you know, in something at least. And I also found out that he was actually sending people to the doctors if necessary when they were very, so which was very interesting. And the same thing happened in a dargah. 
right? Where there were there, there was a coexistence of, uh, you know, the medical treatment systems and the religious uh, uh, healers. And that to me was very, very uh, interesting. And there were, I have, did have some theories about uh, why they were coexisting. See, uh, uh, it took me some time to actually um, not argue against a sociocultural uh, uh, etiological model. Because, I mean, I learned over time. I mean, I had come in from my Western system of education. And uh, we, we were following the comprehensive textbook of uh, psychiatry at that point in time. Of course, now we have a lot of Indian authors who are writing. But the point I'm trying to get across here is that we need to co live in a coexisting manner. And there's no point in debating about it. This the lesson that I learned from all my journeys to the uh, different uh, religious institutions in the state. So my the. Stigma and discrimination do determine, does determine the uh, behavior of the individual, whether it is accessing treatment or whether it is, you know, um, even in a social role functioning, that does definitely play a role in where, the way they are treated or the way the family expects them to behave and so on. So in that context, I think uh, I can go on and on because the narratives are so many where uh, this is concerned, but I think I'll you know, not really hog the show and uh, leave. Uh, yeah, we look forward to other questions to answer. Thank you very much. And I think that's an important point you mentioned in terms of the stigma and uh, why other people don't want to know. Um, and, and I think it also you touched on the kind of why faith um, and belief systems are actually yes. very much important. It's part and parcel of the recovery process. And I think, uh, and I think I keep on saying that just looking at a bottle of Prozac alone, alone will not cure you. So I think you need to be, you need to be working at it. You need, you need to be doing a lot of things along with uh, medication and other other things that you should be doing. So thank you very much for that insight, uh, uh, Doctor Raghu. If I can just add uh, something to what Doctor Padma just mentioned, please, please do. We still get patients referred from the nearby. There are a couple of. Uh, ashrams, you know, uh, run by some religious gurus. Uh, yeah, I think for most minor mental health problems, like mild anxiety or depression, whatever he offers definitely works. But mm -hmm. when it, it when they notice that it is going a little bit beyond what they can handle, they don't hesitate to refer them to us. Uh, at least one or two people a month, you know, I get keep seeing, you know, referred specifically from an ashram nearby Chennai. And the other thing is, as uh, Dr. Padma was mentioning, the, uh, the stigma is much more in the urban setup. You know, in the rural areas, I think you stop in the local tea shop and ask them, is there anyone with a mental health problem? They will rattle out all the door numbers, you know, the fourth house from here, the eighth house with a green door. Uh, they will be able to give us all details about how it happened, why it happened. But again, they may not know the medical model. And as long as this person doesn't disturb them, you know, it is more the behaviors that uh, bother them rather than the cause or the diagnosis. I don't think they bother. The tolerance is much better than what it is in the urban uh, living spaces. So that way, I think the rural areas are People are, uh, uh, this, you know, SCARF's experience with its community outreach in the telepsychiatry project in Pudukote. Uh, we have had an excellent rehabilitation, which was possible because of the community engagement. We were able to uh, educate the people, the general public, you know, the local tea stall guy was asked to support a person with a chronic mental health problem, you know. Uh, he can take pity on him and give a cup of tea. Instead, we told him, you employ him, give him a few cups to wash. And then instead of paying him, you uh, give him a cup of tea. So gradually people were, it was a very uh, informal uh, rehab training that was offered in many of these small joints, you know, whether it was a hotel or a shop or a tea stall. And from there, people improved and were able to move on to better jobs in the community. And I think... Uh, that was primarily because of the amount of work the community level workers were doing uh, in the in the tree in that area. Okay, yeah. No, I think that that's very important. That's a key point that you've actually made in terms of how some of the community organisations and also in terms of how 
the in the rural context they they persevere and they tolerate some of those things whereas in the urban area that may not be the case and there are different ways in how people actually look at it uh, both both personally and also within the family context as well yeah. so as so i think that that nicely moves on to the kind of family context in terms of how how uh, you know how the family is actually involved in it um because obviously you know, just treating the person alone uh, will not actually work here. We all know that, and that it is not rocket science. So I think we all know that. But I think so. What has been the work of families? Um, you know, how do we mobilize the family? How do we inform the family to actually support um, the person with a mental health condition? Um, Honestly, I, I don't think they like have a choice there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have a choice there because. Uh, I think it is a sad state. In India, we don't have a, a social support system. And so uh, families are the only way people can. Otherwise, uh, we don't have enough residential facilities as well for admitting everyone who has a mental health problem. So I think inadvertently, the families have to bear the, uh, the brunt of uh, the impact of the illness. But then, uh, and I think all of, all of us in the group will be aware that uh, the outcome of uh, schizophrenia and other chronic psychotic illnesses is much better in the uh, in countries like India, probably because of the family's role in how they have been able to uh, bring them back into the mainstream. Yeah. And uh, but having also, said that, it's not it's not just that uh, you know all family members are uh, very very uh, supportive. We do have instances when families can be very derogative to the patient, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in the context of uh, marriage, about which I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. But going back to the family system, they, they, like, uh, there is no choice, yes. But that doesn't mean that they have to put up with it. Uh, you know, they, they, it doesn't mean that they put up with it in a very uh, positive manner. I've had instances when, you know, where uh, families would be actually kept the patient would be kept away when there are visitors or there would be, uh, you know, very derogatory remarks made about the uh, patient in a social context and uh, so on. And well, I'm, I'm having acknowledging that, yes, it can be difficult to have a person with schizophrenia who's delusional, who's hallucinating, uh, you know, you know, in a small tenement and so on. But nevertheless, very many times we are faced with the, con uh, you know, with the situation where uh, the families can be a little difficult, right? And one of the things that I think at SCARF particularly we pay attention to is listening to the patient as well. It's not just about listening to the family. You know, the patients sometimes do come and complain about family members and uh, so on. And I think a lot of us there are actually sitting and listening to patients. Um, I'm sure Dr. Mangala can tell many stories on uh, this listening. But what what I'm trying to communicate is that I think we, whether we are mental health professionals or anybody dealing with chronic mental illness, we also need to listen to patients. And that's very, very uh, important. It's not just about uh, the families, because families will give you tons of complaints. You tell, give them an opening and then they will start. But it's not very often that they... Uh, so one of the other things that we do is we try and encourage families to observe small positive things about the patient, you know? Say for example, if the patient has taken a bath every day, we try and bring it to their attention and tell them that, you know, maybe you should acknowledge all this, right? So in that sense, the families can be a very vital um, vital ally in rehabilitation and irrespective of all those derogatory uh, remarks that they make, but we, um, we do need to tap a lot more into the family systems within, the, within our context. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. The family can be a, a helpful person, a helpful context, but it also can be a big barrier as well in relation to some of the treatment yeah. outcomes. Yeah. So in yeah. that context, uh, I think here I must mention that uh, SCARF for the past about 10 years, we have, a, uh, we have instituted an award for caregivers of persons with serious mental illnesses called the Maitri Award, which we give out to... Uh, any caregiver, it could be uh, your mother or a father, wife, your spouse, brother, sister. We have had father-in-law, mother-in-law, you know, uh, any any relative, 
and sometimes even completely unrelated friends or schoolmates, uh, anyone who has gone out of the, beyond the call of duty to take care or support a person with serious mental illnesses, we uh, we give away awards and uh, actually there are so many human stories that come up and uh, the whole event becomes very emotional for everyone who's gathered there. And again, I must say the press has been very, very supportive of this initiative. And when that get covered, gets covered in the media, it reaches out, spreads a lot of positivity. I, like Dr. Padma uh, mentioned, I think there are a lot of difficult families, you know, like you, you feel like uh, really uh, throttling them, but th there are quite a uh, so very large number of families who are extremely involved in taking care of their loved ones. And uh, yeah, so every year around the Schizophrenia Day, we have this uh, event, you know, where we give out awards for families and caregivers of persons with serious mental illnesses. That, that, that's, that's brilliant. I think that's, I mean, that is actually valuing people, their contribution, the kind of things that they're actually doing, and also giving uh, the family members, including the person with the condition, a kind of a satisfaction that we are, we are actually moving on, we are maybe on the right track, and a kind of feedback in really in relation to, you know, there is somebody who's actually there to listen to us, there is some, a lot of things, and I think it is a kind of, um, you know, the, uh, how sharing that story, Sharing that story is actually in itself a major aspect of the treatment, which which many of us uh, know, but I think sometimes uh, it is not actually recognized and the kind of the, the carer's role and how the carers would actually come into that context too. There are life so, lessons for us as well. You know, there are so many things that uh, we could pick up, but things that we are cribbing about in our daily life, you know, there are lessons for every one of us from many of those stories that are being told. Yeah, okay. I think Dr. Padma has just gone. I think hopefully she will come back. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, so. Anyway, let's 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 move on. I think our audience, um, please uh, share your questions on the um, on the chat um, box or the question and answer box. Um, so uh, please share your questions and then we'll answer them live or you know, or, or any points that you want which make us absolutely have to be all, all questions. So. Please um, feel free to share your questions, concerns, or thoughts or feelings uh, on the chat box. Right, so now can I move on to the kind of, um, you know, young people? Um, SCARB is actually doing a lot of work with um, the youth. Um, and and um, because it is, it is very important because the youth of today are the kind of better citizens, the employers, employees, uh, and, and the future prime ministers or future, you know, uh, all aspects of life. So, how 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 is that actually working in relation to working with young people? Um, and what are the kind of strategies that we can actually use to um, mobilize mental health literacy uh, in, in young people? Uh, I think earlier, what we used to do was just use the schools uh, and colleges as platforms where we used to uh, give them just mental health awareness. No, uh, we were not focusing primarily on their mental health needs. But now over the years, I think uh, it has evolved a lot. And uh, uh, we have had, we now have a, a dedicated youth mental health program. I think Dr. Padma is back so she can take no, over yeah. and talk about it. Uh, so now that that is in place, the focus is primarily on the mental health needs and addressing those issues and not really uh, restricted to just giving them mental health awareness, yeah. Uh, so just to carry on about the youth, uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with schools and colleges, now we have a system in place where we are actually using digital technology to identify if there are any uh, instances of mental health symptomatology in the young people. And we actually did a study where we focused on the age groups between 14 and 18. And um, it was not just enough to identify a mental health problem. We also gave them a dedicated number which they could call. And so there were no identifiers in the uh, app. So we really didn't know who was this kid who had a problem. So there was another initiative where we got together as mental health professionals in a particular, uh, you know, within the city, about nearly 20 of them. 
and we provided them training that say, okay, these are the schools where we are going to be doing these um, campaigns. And if children come from here to you, please take care of them. Right. So in that sense, I believe a number of uh, uh, children have actually gone by themselves to the mental health professionals. So somebody who's 16, 17, 18, they did not hesitate to walk into a mental health clinic so that they could get help. And I think that has been a huge impact on, uh, um, you know, creating awareness amongst the young people, especially in schools. And everything was confidential. So we do not know who's the kid who's gone there. Kids. The other classmates do not know. So there was uh, an element of confidentiality, which gave them the confidence to go and speak to the mental health professional. In fact, we, we can't evaluate that because we don't have the data. We don't have the data because we respect the confidentiality of the uh, young people. But we thought, you know, it's, uh, it's worth it because ultimately our aim is that there should be early access to treatment. And so it was really, in fact, after one such program, there was one kid who came to SCARF. And uh, so I said, okay, why did you come to SCARF? Because you know, this is a center for mental health, uh, serious mental disorders. And why did you come here? She said, no, if I have, the kid was very bright, 16 years old from a nearby school. And she said, uh, you know, um, the first step in, you know, managing any kind of problem is to acknowledge the problem. And so what if I go to this place, which I thought was a fascinating uh, impact that we had on our uh, on one one kid. I'm sure many of my colleagues would have received other kids, but I this to me, this kid is unforgettable because of the maturity that she showed. And I'm very sure that her parents may not have allowed her because we've had many instances that were, you know, um, where children um, are actually barred from seeking help simply because their parents don't allow it. Where the parents are scared, stigma, labeling, medication, psychiatric medication, for example, everything, uh, the myths and misconceptions, uh, uh, you know, that surround it, right? So that it's it's been a real lovely journey in that in that sense about the youth. Okay, we have some we have some questions on the chat box, and I think I'll take them yes. uh, for the first one. Um, about um, any experience with um, formation of self-help groups of recovered patients and caregivers? Uh, is, uh, is there anything that SCARF does or do you know what actually happens? It doesn't necessarily have to do with SCARF, but uh, in a broader context, an Indian context as well. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, you go ahead. Yeah. yeah, we have not had any self-help group created at SCARF. Uh, we attempted forming uh, an organization of sort of uh, of people with lived experiences coming together, but then it never took shape. So uh, it had to be disbanded. But then in the community at Pudukote, where uh, we were offering teleconsultation services, uh, at least two self-help groups were formed with the support of SCARF, comprising of only patients who have had serious mental illnesses. And uh, there are uh, two groups each having about six to eight members and they are active at the moment they are functioning uh, only thing is initially they needed a lot of hand holding um, but it was the families who are actually taking more part in the activity but we still wanted the in on paper it, it for it to exist as a self-help group for persons with mental disabilities alone besides that we have had some success in uh, making persons with serious mental illnesses as part of existing other men, uh, self-help groups, you know, which that we have been able to do uh, on a slightly larger scale. And what we found when we were, when we deal with the women self-help groups in the city is many of them do have mental health problems and they are on treatment at some place or other. It's only thing is they are not getting uh it is not that they are getting into the group as a mental health service user. They are just coming there as part of a person living in that community. So there are a lot of people with mental health problems in self-help groups. Okay, thank you. Dr. Padma? Is she? Okay. Um, I will come back. Um, we'll come back. 
We'll come back. I'll come back to the question with Dr. Padma uh, in a minute. But I think there are there are indeed kind of peer support networks and there are peer group organizations in many many parts of India as well, which in a way is also acting as a kind of a uh, you know new ways of actually dealing with this. But we have also noticed, though we don't have a formal uh, uh, self help group that is being formed, uh, people who stay together for prolonged periods either in the residential facility or in the daycare center Ratska, they tend to form small groups and offer support to each other, you know, going out. Uh, we also encourage them to uh, have informal uh, talks or uh, outings where you know, they can talk about things beyond their medication and who's your treating doctor and how much you know you're taking, you know, beyond that kind of conversation, they do have an opportunity to discuss very personal things, you know, and new friendships definitely born. And I can share one interesting incident where one patient was, he <coughs> had a relapse and was refusing to come to the hospital. And uh, we had we had no way we could, any of the case managers could approach him. So the next best option was we sent two of his close buddies in the daycare center home. They were able to convince him and bring him to the hospital for treatment. And uh, actually we awarded those two people along with the caregivers, you know, because uh, what they are doing is uh, leading by example. So uh, we have had that kind of experiences where one patient is supporting other, but a formal self-help group is not it in place at SCA. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mangala. The, uh... The uh, you know in the rural population we were able to uh, engage the uh, you know this uh, when Dr. Mangla was mentioning about the self help groups uh, in the rural communities it was possible to integrate them within the existing uh, self help groups. Uh, it would be see like she had already told earlier there are a lot more tolerance in the rural areas than uh, in the urban uh, locality. But I must tell you here that. The mandate of many uh, collaborative studies right now is to look at the involvement of a lived experienced uh, uh, individual. So LEAP uh, panel, that is a lived experience advisory panels become uh, an integrated part of many of the funding uh, resources. So as part of that, in, in the recent times over the last one year, we are doing a research project on uh, in collaboration with Pakistan. In fact, uh, the, in fact, one of the members of our um, Pakistan team is also here available. Uh, thanks, Sonaiza, for being here. And so what we did, uh, we, did we are now doing is, you know, uh, trying to get the LEAP members not just to interact with each other, but also to comment on or advise us on the implementation of the project. Right. And there's also a plan that they if they are interested and there are people who are interested is to uh, enable their research potential, which I think is a very uh, fascinating uh, idea, because why should it be limited to just uh, trained mental health professionals? Right. And uh, uh, Onesa has actually raised a question on digital engagement and social media for mental health awareness. Uh, Dr. Rabu, if you don't mind, I would respond to that yeah, and ask point. Mangla to take over on uh, that. So one of the, I think, to my to my knowledge, most of the digital engagement of social media and this endeavors have been over the last two years because of the pandemic, we've had to use them quite uh, actively. And over a period of time, we found that, you know, people engaging with the social media uh, uh, announcements it has been gradually uh, increasing. And uh, I'm sure that would be the experience all over the world where um, people are actually using. Of course, we've also used things like WhatsApp uh, videos and so on in providing intervention, not just WhatsApp, even other uh, video platforms, mostly WhatsApp because most people have a uh, broadband, uh, I mean, they have a smartphone and engaging them in a for teleconsultations, uh, using uh, videos, uh, you know, any kind of video platform for that matter, not necessarily uh, uh, WhatsApp, we have been able to provide intervention using that, right? And I think, again, it, it needs to be uh, better utilized, more creatively utilized, and I'm sure the way forward will be to see how we can engage with the social media. Mangla, you might, might more want to add on that. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, madam. Uh, I, yeah, there is a lot of uh, scope for using the social media and the digital uh, platform for raising awareness. 
one thing is uh, there's a lot of anonymity that is available so people are more willing to come uh, forward to discuss their problems uh, not just the digital media we have noticed that uh, people uh, are willing to talk about their problems over the phone in a uh, telecalling in programs on tv or uh, uh, radio uh, i mean uh, they don't mind the whole world watching it or uh, listening to it because their identity is clearly not seen so i think uh, people are willing to talk about it they just need a place to talk about so it is happening what we are looking at right now is uh, more of podcast and because if we are going to have stories of lived experiences of persons with uh, schizophrenia or any other serious mental illness a podcast where their face is not revealed will be a easier option for them to uh, uh, come forward to do because we are looking at developing a human library we did participate in live human libraries as part of a regular show that the british council organizes in chennai when at least two or three of our uh, patients clients and uh, uh, volunteers have come forward to share their uh, story there and it was very well received so uh, we thought we could make it a regular event but then the pandemic set in and we have not been able to uh, move further on that uh, so we thought we will make it digital instead of the person going uh repeatedly telling their stories and i personally felt that can be very traumatic to relive the same experience again and again repeatedly to multiple audiences so just narrate it once we will get it recorded and then uh use it digitally any number of times that we want so that would be a, a better option so that way we could exploit the digital platform very well and uh Uh, conducting surveys now has become very easy uh, after the social uh, media platforms have come we did try one for the mental health day and uh, sadly we didn't have a huge number we just had 200 people who took the survey so uh, not a big number given the uh, uh, reach of these platforms so uh, there is still a lot of things that we need to do and i think we also need to know how to package uh certain things to make people take it so that finally matters yeah yeah i think that that's very important in terms of how how the information is actually given on the social media because then i think there's a right we we started off with the right kind of information and providing the right kind of information on social media is very important so thank you for that we have a couple of questions in the question uh, box as well i'll come back to the other questions too in a minute um one of the things is that what role does the public health sector Uh, such as the public health commission i presume the hcs and government hospitals play in terms of community mobilization and rehabilitation any any thoughts on that yeah yeah i must say that in the city of uh, in in the state of tamil nadu the government uh, mental health systems uh, do make some noise i mean it, in a sense that they do carry out uh, you know public awareness programs and so on but then we are in a state where there's a lot of people doing lot of mental health activity so sometimes you know um, uh, it's it's quite uh, uh, interesting to watch how uh, you know different uh, stakeholders are actually acting on these uh, and to a certain extent you know the the national health mission and the district mental health programs have actually been quite uh, successful in creating a good reach but i do think that the machinery here is quite strong and that's what really helps to carry forward the uh, information because see ultimately it bottle bo- bo- boils down to providing services it's not enough creating uh, an awareness you also need to follow it up with providing services and that is something that i think is quite uh, remarkable in the state of tamil nadu and which is uh, which makes it quite uh, um, useful that it's not again to use repeatedly use this word i think we are coexisting an ngo sector along with the government uh, run machinery we are kind of uh, co- coexisting so for example we are working with one of the uh, uh, with an ngo in one uh, you know near velor uh, in velor district and so whomever we are actually uh, during training or during any kind of we do run clinics but these clinics are accessed 
tele teleclinics are not accessed very easily. We did find that people were reaching the restrict mental health program from that locality. So which means that some place that message has uh, reached out to them. So uh, it has been quite a, uh, uh, well, I won't really, I, I don't, would not, I don't know if we should define it as a success story, but then things are quite good in terms of the government run uh, mission. In Mangala, of course, there will be differing viewpoints and uh, from different uh, uh, sectors of the community. Mangala, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think whatever we as NGOs do, we have our own limitations. If we are looking at a impact at a big level, I think it has to be the state-run uh, institutions. And uh, I must say that now that the district mental health program is in place, they are doing excellent work when it comes to awareness and uh, spreading uh, the message about mental health is, uh, yet mental illness is treatable and it is uh, almost uh, seen in all areas in Tamil Nadu. And uh, I think finally, it's only the improvement that happens with treatment, which will be the best anti-stigma campaign. And uh, that is what is go finally going to do the trick. So if we are able to provide un I mean, uh, uh, uninterrupted medical services, and ensure that the person's uh, improvement is sustained enough for him to find his own livelihood, I think then uh, I, I, that would be the best thing. You know, it will be the best anti-stigma campaign for people to uh, approach treatment for serious mental illnesses. That's right. And I think that's something that the May Help um, uh, Project and the May Help India Foundation are trying to do in terms of spreading the message of uh, creating that awareness in what it is rightly. But there is always, as, as Dr. Padma um, uh, mentioned, there is always the issue about, you know, if you can become more aware then becomes more demand and then there is the services have freshly meet up those demands so it's a it's a vicious circle and i think in a country such as india with diverse systems diverse culture um, and also i think it is how i mean and the diversity of services the diversity of how the ngos play a major role how the families play a major role how the statutory health systems actually play a major role all those things are actually pretty important and, and and i think you don't see that anywhere else in the world in that's such a diverse way of actually looking at mental health and well-being and the issues as well we have um, i'm conscious of time um, i think we have another 15 minutes so uh, briefly going through some of the questions there is another, another question here about what are some of the research areas that you believe require work like the um, um like mentioned the exploration of lived experiences Dr. Padma, to stop. Yeah. So, um, well, health education research uh, is quite popular in several kind of disease entities, not so much in the field of mental health, right? But however, I, we will also have to consider what are the outcomes that we are measuring. Is it just gains in knowledge, or is it accessing treatment? Is it a change in attitudes? Is it sustained change in attitudes? There are a whole lot of uh, uh, questions surrounding uh, methods in uh, where health, mental health education or mental health literacy research is concerned. Uh, I do believe that it is still in infancy, but there are there is a lot of work happening, uh, you know, uh, globally. And if we do find, uh, uh, if when we where, if we get some good uh, methodology, I'm sure and uh, funding resources, of course. We can definitely look at how, um, what is the impact of different kinds of uh, mental health uh, yeah, literacy programs that can have, well, is it the films, is it cinema, is it face-to-face, um, -face? is it street theater, and so on. So we can actually, uh, you know, do a lot of, uh, uh, we need to do a lot of scoping research to find out what works best, what matters most as far as public uh, research in this area is uh, concerned. Yeah. Dr. Mangala? Uh, well, uh, I'm not a, a great uh, researcher to begin with, but my take on this question will be, uh, if we could incorporate mental health as a component in research that is happening in the social determinants of health, you know, whether any gender-based studies or if it is about uh, Sub the substance use disorders in the community, or even uh, 
poverty, violence, you know, if we just incorporate a mental health component into most of these social determinants of uh, uh, health in the community, I think that would help us understand uh, all these factors better. Um, things like structural violence, all those things can be uh, studied more by social researchers than mental health researchers. And if mental health component is consciously added to it, it would be a great yeah. service. Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely right. With this, uh, I mean, particularly with the, con in the context of non-communicable diseases. Yeah. We know that for a condition like schizophrenia, the main reasons for mortality is NCDs. And when we look at, uh, you know, incorporating uh, mental health into NCD research, right? Uh, we definitely can, one tap a lot more mental health and maybe also create this awareness that's needed for dealing with the NCD component. So in that, in that sense, uh, it, it would be a very useful, and actually a lot of research now is, Public health research is actually incorporating mental health into their uh, own spheres, and which is a good news because I'm sure the trends will get better, and we will start, uh, you know, uh, understanding more about the the uh, the combination of the two uh, conditions. Actually, in keeping with the same thing, there's another question in the chat box on uh, um, on how a men, how can one who is not a mental health professional be a mental health advocate? Oh, I think a person who is not a mental health professional would perhaps be a better advocate than we psychiatrists or psychologists or social workers talking, right? Um, very many times, uh, you know, the people who, if you go to a public forum and somebody who's not, a, I mean, of course, they would not be saying that they're not a mental health uh, men, uh, person who is not a mental health professional. But I, we do find that people in from the general community, if they communicate, there is a lot of listening to what they are saying, right? So we do have volunteers and all who come in, who walk in, and who, you know take part in our uh, programs. And I think it's I must tell you, share a fascinating story here about how uh, uh, the. Uh, we used, we would have, we had a program on dementia actually, and we were inaugurating something and I don't recollect exactly right now, but many years ago, we were inaugurating a dementia program. And there was just somebody who just walked in and said, I want to talk and had nothing to do with dementia, nothing to do with mental health. And he just said, well, I've heard about SCARF. I've heard about the work that you're doing. You're doing something new. Why don't I just join in? And, uh, and he must have spoken for about five to 10 minutes and very interestingly right yeah. which is what i think so uh, i don't know i think i can only see the word deep so mr deep mr or miss deep whoever it is uh, you're most welcome to join bandwagons with uh, uh, you know with any mental health uh, organization and maybe you can take off on your own at some point in time i think that's absolutely right and i think in terms of how we can actually join up um, the organization any of the organizations would be pretty pretty good yeah Dr. Mangala, you're going to say something? Yeah, actually, on the uh, on this note, yeah, Nimans runs a, a course for uh, people to become volunteers in mental health, for being yeah, uh, yeah. mental health volunteers. Actually, uh, we have been uh, discussing about starting something like that at SCARF as well, you know, so that we just train them to become volunteers and they will run some of the programs where we are not able to go every time in person. And to add about the previous point, uh, in today's Times of India, there was an article that was written by one of our uh, fellows of the, uh, the mental health uh, reporting fellows about the diabetic distress. That is the term that they use for uh, talking about the mental health problems associated with diabetes. And, uh, the diabetologists have found a way of handling it themselves, you know, not necessarily referring them to a psychiatrist, which is a good thing. They are able to offer services under the same roof. So uh, that calls for a lot of collaboration between mental health professionals and uh, uh, diabetologists to come up with these kind of findings. 
Yeah, and I think the mention about the kind of I mean, you talked about the physical health and mental health and how they are interrelated. The thing is that mental health is not some discriminatory identity that actually happens somewhere else. You need to bring into the physical health angle. What about a person with diabetes? What about a person with cancer? What about a person with heart disease? And what about a person with any other condition? They all actually experience mental distress. They all actually experience uh, you know some kind of condition as well, especially with the you know, cancer that are many many things. That actually happening. I mean, I think it's actually, is accepting that, is uh, creating that awareness of that for the person and for the family, and also getting the right kind of support. I think what we must be careful here is not to over-medicalize our own emotions um, and other things, which is what this special conversation is all about, not over-medicalize it. And I think that's exactly what we want to actually pitch on. And I think you mentioned about any areas of research, really. And um, we talked about, and then we, why don't we look at how, how do we not over-medicalize, um, you know, the mental health. In the UK, um, in the last quarter, I, from September to December, um, there were about 70 million prescriptions for, anti for antidepressants given out. 70 million prescriptions. Okay. And, and we are supposed to be a developed world. We're supposed to be a high standard of medical care. Why haven't they found a cure for, a cure for any of these things? So basically, there are no easy answers here. I think we need to try and develop some of the, what the best um, culturally uh, and socially adapted model might actually work for the individual, family, and, and the cultures um, and, and those kind of contexts. As well. So it is very, very much important that we try and bring in the physical angle to the mental health uh, angle too. Really. Few, few more points in relation to chronic mental uh, illness to reduce the burden of institutional uh, rehabilitation. Um, so there is there's a scope, any, uh, any scope for foster care, foster care programs um, to, um, uh, to reduce the burden of institutional rehabilitation. That's a, yeah, that's but I must tell you. Pandora's box, Go ahead. <laughs> and we will start crying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, but one of the things we must understand here is that uh, the yeah. whole concept of foster care or institutional rehabilitation uh, is really taken over by the family support that we have here. So you really don't have too many such homes, too many, uh, I mean, the existing mental hospitals are pretty overcrowded and so on, because there is a need for chronic mentally ill to be there. But if you really look at the, uh, you know, number of uh, uh, rehabilitation homes that are there, they're not there are not too many as you would find in um, you know, a better developed country. And that's because I think the family system is so strong here. So we have, you know, say if a parent is about 80 plus years old and he has a son or a daughter who's 60 plus years old, they will continue to keep them. So, okay, after my lifetime, let them, you know, get into a home or they would act, approach some an organization like staff and say, okay, what happens after I die? Will you take care of him? Right. So that's the system. They don't want to send their family members to the um, foster care or to an institutional setup. And so really, um, I, I don't see the scope of a program for uh, foster care uh, emerging in a big way. Maybe, you know, a couple of decades when family size is reduced so much that you do need these homes, it might come into war, but not at the moment. But they gain so one of the available before, only for people who can afford. Uh, the rest yeah, that's the another thing, will yeah. still uh, continue to take care, irrespective of all the difficulties that they are facing. Okay, thank you. One of the Thanks. things that I think needs a mention here, uh, Dr. Raghu, just bear with me for one moment, yeah, because sure, I sure. think it's important while we are on the topic of uh, mental health literacy, the challenges that we have uh, faced, and there are numerous. I mean, if we, we get more, Dr. Mangala to talk, I'm sure she'll be able to tell us numerous uh, challenges but then one of the important things that we have to acknowledge is you know sometimes um, doors slammed on your face when I mean that what I mean by that is there have been instances when people don't want to listen I've, I have actually been to many uh, schools where one school uh, principal actually said look I don't want you to talk to my children about mental health problems because I don't want to think that they are mentally ill Right. Of course, this happened about a decade ago and uh, things have changed subsequently. But then, you know, all that it does is uh, raise the question of, you know, who's being stigmatized right here and who's, you know, experiencing this 
stigma more often. There are plenty of challenges that uh, we do come across, but I think the whole thing bottles down to creatively handling even the uh, challenges. It's not an easy field. But I think with a little bit of creative uh, handling, it will definitely, and which we have done, I think over the last three and a half decades, we have handled every challenge uh, in a very solution focused uh, kind of approach. Okay. I think I, it is more yeah. about when we talk about serious mental illnesses, you know, people feel they are not able to relate with it because they do not experience it. But then when we uh, steer the conversation to common mental health conditions, you know, especially about things like feeling low or feeling fatigued, disinterested and sleep disturbances, they definitely relate better and are able to engage better. I think uh, we understood that starting the conversation with common mental disorders is the best way to engage the crowd and then give them, sensitize them about uh, other illnesses. And I think when we mention alcohol as a mental health condition, I think the, the shock that the males in the audience go through is a, it's interesting to watch. That is what I have noticed over uh, the several years in okay. the session. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think there is a question here in relation to about community mobilization. Um, but different strategies in rural and urban setting we talked about it. But the question is actually, uh, what are the things being focused um, in, 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 in those settings? Any brief comments? Uh, yeah, see, uh, I think when we were working in the communities, it was specifically uh, the serious mental illnesses that we were targeting. And so the focus was primarily about that. Um, because, uh, and once that was becoming better, people were willing to seek help for common mental disorders as well. So, but that was more in the passing. Uh, but in the urban settings, our focus is more on common mental disorders because if there is a serious mental health problem and if it has been there for a few months, now people are aware that they have to seek help. Whereas in the rural areas, they don't know where to go and they have no access to services, which is where we need to tell them that is it is treatable and you please come to us because they have no hope about something becoming better in life. So I think we look at two completely different uh, aspects of mental health in the two uh, different regions. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I think uh, there's also some. Uh, there was a comment in the in the in the chat box as well about how can um, uh, young psychologists support the community mobilization efforts efforts uh, efforts of SCAR. Any quick comments. You're more than welcome to join us. <laughs> We'd be happy to have you here. We definitely need more and more advocates. Uh, for, uh, you know, uh, carrying the message across to the public. So um, we, we, you're most welcome to uh, visit us and, you know, have an in-person in conversation. Thank you very much for that. I think that's, so I think this, you know, this is isn't interesting. I think, you know, you've been here for nearly an hour and a half, um, coming and touching an hour and a half. So interesting conversation. I think we started off from little things and then we kind of grown into all these major conversations around, uh, mental health, uh, mental ill health, family and uh, stigma, young people. A lot, of, a lot of things here that we need to uh, again come back and discuss some of those things and in, in, in months and years to come. And I think we will, we will make um, a conscious effort um, in, in, in doing that in different ways as to how we can bring people together. I think what is important is just to try and, you know, um, as, as has been mentioned by our panel, that um, you, you know, people don't actually talk about it. So how can we encourage uh, this um, fearless conversation on mental health and well-being? Because mental health is not mental illness. Mental health and well-being is very different. How can we have a conversation around that? Yes, because of there are some uh, issues around what one is actually experiencing, psychologically, socially, family-wise, and what they might actually experience certain conditions, etc., which might actually require some treatment. Um, and also sometimes some people might actually require long-term treatment uh, in, in relation to some of those things. But I think consciously from the younger, from the younger generation, also from the older generation, how do we in our condition have that um, 
uh, fearless conversation. You mentioned when we touched on the kind of humanitarian angle, you know, there is a minefield out there in terms of all the people and how do we actually bring all the people into this conversation um, about social isolation, loneliness and social isolation, because that is actually a very key issue in the West. And I think in India is actually sitting on a time bomb in relation to that loneliness and social isolation and dementia care as well, wherever much is not known about some of those things. So, um, what can I say? And I think it's <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patnavati and Dr. Mangala for joining us. And I think it came from a casual email conversation that we had, but something else. And I think this has actually got us uh, talking about a number of issues. And I'm sure there are, there are uh, major bridges that we could actually build between us and many other people concerned in the field, both nationally and internationally in relation to how we take forward some of those um, points that we have actually discussed today. And I'm very grateful to you for, for um, uh, you know, sparing your time, your devoted time, uh, I know, um, uh, and, and for us, uh, for Me Help India Foundation, and we aim to promote mental health literacy in urban and rural communities. So thank you all for joining us. Um, watch the space again. So we have another webinar on the 7th of April on the World Health Day. We are actually discussing um, no health, uh, health with an international panel uh, of, of, of people as from two from the UK and two from, from the Indian context. So many thanks for joining. Keep supporting our work. Keep supporting uh, the scarf work, um, and also you know, you know do um, keep in touch with us and and uh, try and 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 enable uh, and empower uh, people with mental distress and be kind and and also promote self care and understanding about mental health and well being. So many thanks, uh, and thank you, Parvati, for hosting this webinar um, for us. Um, and uh, thank you, I, will send, I will send you a brief, um, uh, I'll send you an invite on, on, on Zoom again, just to kind of um, catch up uh, just for five minutes after this, because we can't actually do that on this context. So, um, so bear with me for, for a few minutes. So thank you all, and namaste, and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Raghu, it was, it was interesting. Yeah and very thought provoking to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you.